Way back in 1981, a friend who worked at Chandra's Lines tipped me off to an unbeatable $235 fare for a week-long cruise aboard the SS Britannus out of San Juan. With the ship's likely retirement pending, it was an opportunity not to be missed. At nearly 50 years old, the Britannus had an incredible history. Originally billed as one of the new sovereigns of the Pacific, the Britannus was built as the SS Monterey in 1932. Along with her nearly identical sister, the Mariposa, she offered voyages to Hawaii, the South Pacific, New Zealand, and Australia from the West Coast. At 632 by 79 feet and measuring 18,017 gross tons, these handsome ships would soon be joined by a third sister, the SS Lurleen, which would sail between California and Hawaii. The state-of-the-art Monterey was a two-class liner, boasting a rather palatial first class that catered to 472 passengers. The first-class lounge and smoking room were imposing double-deck spaces with hand-painted murals and a sort of Asiatic meets tropical style of decor. There was even a dedicated dance pavilion and in the heart of the ship, a double-deck air-conditioned dining room. The most deluxe staterooms were years ahead of their time and had a private veranda. Other deluxe staterooms had a separate living room that faced full-length windows. And in their early years, this trio of ships had long, fully enclosed promenades. A less opulent but comfortable cabin class catered to 229 passengers. Cabin class had its own suite of public rooms, including a lounge and a library, a smoking room, and a dining room. In 1939, after the outbreak of World War II, a large American flag was painted on the Monterey stern. Following Pearl Harbor and the U.S. entry into the war, the Monterey was converted for trooping duties. On November 6, 1943, she rescued 1,675 survivors from the torpedoed Grace Liner Santa Elena. During her trooping duties, the Monterey steamed 328,490 miles and carried over 170,000 troops, many of whom were accommodated in stacked bunks in her former public areas. After the war, due to a lack of funding, work to restore the Monterey to passenger service was halted and she remained in layup with the Mariposa until the Mariposa was sold to Home Lines, who rebuilt her into the successful cruise ship Homeric in 1953. In 1956, with new demand on Matson's Hawaiian run, the Monterey was renamed Matsonia and towed to Newport News, Virginia for a complete transformation. Including her purchase price, $17.5 million was spent to bring the Matsonia up to the standard of her legendary sister, Lurleen. When the work was finished, the wife of Honolulu's mayor, Mrs. Neil S. Blaisdell, christened the ship. Now touted as Hawaii afloat, the Matsonia sailed off to New York for previews and then to the West Coast to begin her new career as a one-class deluxe cruise ship. Marine architects from Gibbs and Cox worked with designer Harry Neefy in creating a safe, sound, and spectacular ship that would complement the Lurleen. Externally, the two were practically indistinguishable, save for Matsonia's clipper bow extension and her having just one versus three sets of midships Lanai suites. The Matsonia was heralded as the new playground of the Pacific. Shortly after her maiden arrival in Los Angeles, my model mother and her colleagues were ushered on board for a fashion shoot. After her first cruise to Hawaii, 11 days later, Matsonia made a big splash on her maiden San Francisco arrival. 
The Matsonia had eight passenger decks, beginning at the top with sun deck, which featured an observation platform. Aft of officers' accommodations, a sports court was located between the ship's funnels. Boat deck had finite open promenades that stretched aft from the bridge to a terrace overlooking the stern. Promenade deck began with single staterooms that led to finite sheltered promenades on either side. These images from a Matsonia brochure show similar staterooms that were on the Lurleen. The lounge, like all of the ship's public areas and accommodations, was stripped to the bare steel framework and completely rebuilt. Harry Neefy's decorative touches included a pastel palette and ceramics with Hawaiian motifs that were made by Hawaiian craftsmen. The smoking room followed the lounge. It had galleries on either side and a bar on its aft port side. ballroom overlooked the stern and featured a dome ceiling with enameled butterflies designed by Harry Neefy. Upper deck was mostly dedicated to a wide variety of accommodations, from comfortable doubles to the most opulent lanai suites with their separate living rooms and floor-to-ceiling windows. At the far aft end of upper deck, the marine veranda opened onto the pool area and featured mosaic panels, cane furnishings, and mosaic topped cocktail tables. More accommodations span the bulk of main deck, including double outsides and lanai bedrooms with partitioned living rooms. At the aft end of main deck, a library and a children's playroom opened onto the fantail. A deck was dedicated to more accommodations and the main entry foyer. The dining room was located on B deck and was a thoroughly modernized space with stainless steel frame chairs and carved tiki's set within a backdrop of faux tropical foliage. And way down on aft C deck there was a dedicated cinema. For the next six years, the Matsonia and Lurline were the queens of the Pacific, playing host to a variety of celebrities and politicians, from Ronald Reagan to Elvis Presley. When the Lurline began to experience costly turbine issues, she was laid up in 1963. She was bought by Chandra's Lines, who repaired her, renamed her Elenies, and placed her in UK to Australia service with a doubled capacity. 
In December of 1963, the Matsonia was renamed Lurline and carried on her Hawaiian service in the Grand Manor of Matson. The fourth Lurline spent her final years on expanded Hawaiian itineraries and even made a cruise to the Caribbean. At one point, one-night cruises between Los Angeles and San Francisco were being offered for a mere $58, which included a return flight on United. The Lurline's high operating costs were no longer sustainable, and in June of 1970, she was sold to Chandra's Lines and renamed Britannis. She left San Francisco with her funnels painted in Chandris's blue and sailed for Piraeus where she was refitted for UK to Australian service in tandem with her sister Elenis and the former SS America, the Australis. When Chandris's Australian service began to wind down, Britannis spent more and more time cruising. By 1981, she had already had a long and successful career, actually twice as long as most passenger ships. After a long series of red-eye flights from Los Angeles, we arrived in San Juan on a rainy day. From the base of the long gangway, Britannis looked massive. She had a slight list, and when we stepped onto her promenade, we actually stepped into a four-inch deep puddle. This seasoned old lady gave us a challenging first impression. Our cabin was a tiny inside upper and lower that was more than adequate for the price we paid. The following day found us in steamy St. Martin, where several of the ship's mostly Venezuelan passengers actually took turns jumping off the stern for a swim. Our Waikiki dining room table mates included a nice Venezuelan couple who helped me brush up on my long-neglected Spanish. I was actually very happy we weren't assigned to eat in the grim coral restaurant that was added in the Britannis conversion from Lurline. On our next day at sea, we had time to explore the ship and found she was sadly showing her age. A crew member told us she had a damaged screw and would soon be sailing to Greece for layup. He suggested her parts would be used to keep the Elenis running. My friend Fred was a good sport. Clearly this was no luxury cruise, but we made the most of it and ended up having a great time. This was the first time either of us had been to the Caribbean and we enjoyed our tours of Martinique and Caracas. On our second sea day, there was a bridge tour and a lively bingo session in the ballroom in Spanish, French, and English. The once lofty lounge was now a busy casino, but scored extra points for still sporting its hairy Neefy ceramic tikis. On our last afternoon, the Britannis looked beautiful as she soaked up the virgin sun of St. Thomas. I was resigned to the idea that this would be the best way to remember her. The Britannis did steam off to Greece, but instead of donating parts to Elenis, the exact opposite happened. Elenis was quietly retired, and Britannis was repaired and lovingly restored. I would next encounter Britannis in New York in the mid-80s when she was operating short party cruises for fantasy cruises. There was still much life left in the old gal, so please stay tuned for part two. Thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe to the Midship Century channel so we can bring you more. Also available from Midship Century is our latest DVD, Torn Castle, which tells the story of the RMS Windsor Castle from her glory days to her sad demise at Alang.